Joining us from New York is Mark Bristow, the new president and CEO of Barrick Gold. Mr. Bristow, thank you very much and congratulations on your new assignment. You've got a big, big company to, to lead. Let's begin by talking about, uh, uh, about the size of the portfolio and perhaps the risk in the portfolio. The people who like this transaction like the fact that you have a heavy majority now or a large majority of the best gold mines on the planet. Those who are less enthusiastic about it point to political risks stemming from uh, the heavy exposure to Africa. Why don't you uh, tell investors what they need to understand about that political risk? A uh, very good morning to you, Paul, and Happy New Year to you and the team there at BNN. Yeah, I think, you know, the point here is that you can't choose where world-class gold deposits are, as uh, I've always said, and this combination brings um, the, the majority of the top 10 gold assets under one roof, and that's super exciting. And in addition to that, there's more in the pipeline, in particular the uh, Turquoise Ridge and, uh, and the Four Mile um, Gold Rush projects in Nevada, which have the potential to meet that criteria of joining the, what we refer to as tier one assets. Um, so, and I've always said, you know, if you want to be a world-class gold business, you've got to start with asset quality. That's really the dictator of the revenue of our business. And, uh, and uh, Barrick, the new Barrick today, uh, as you correctly say, dominates that uh, top tier portfolio and there's no other gold miner who has more than one of those tier one assets as, as the way we define them. And, uh, and with it also, uh, we open up our jurisdictions in Argentina, Chile, uh, Peru. Uh, fantastic operation in the Dominican Republic. Of course, Nevada, the modern day Witwatersrand as a destination. Um, with, as I've just pointed out, huge upsides. And of course, uh, the other assets in, in Africa, whether they are our core tier one assets from Rangold Resources in the form of Kabali or Lulo, Goncoto. And, uh, and also we've got the Acacia investment that needs attention. Um, and, and with that, and another frontier in, in that uh, Tanzania is the other end of the gold belt which we're exploiting in the DRC. As you take a look at the portfolio that the, the new company has, are asset sales likely and what, what might be the, the timeline and when the market may hear about uh, assets that Barrick decides to sell? So we, I've always said, Paul, and you, you, you'll be aware of this, is that this industry was you know, following the, the, the disappointments of the end of the last decade. Um, really needs uh, reinvention and uh, it was running the risk of becoming uh, irrelevant and, and this transaction uh, which we celebrate today really puts uh, Barrick at the front back. I always say Barrick is back, you know, we, Barrick became, people got a little jaundiced about Barrick, Barrick and there's no need to, 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 to have that um, um, uh, view of the company. It's got fantastic assets, it's been through a tough time uh, it's, it's certainly got enormous opportunity and, uh, and, and, and along with the Rand Gold cash flow, uh, I've got no doubt that we will uh, deliver on that, uh, on that strategic objective. What is the future of Barrick Gold in Canada? And I ask because there have been uh, uh, some fairly substantial cuts at the head office here in, uh, in, uh, in Canada. Uh, John Thornton resides, I understand, in Florida. You reside, I understand, outside of North America. And there's only one single mine uh, that Barrick operates here. That's the Hemlo mine in northern Ontario. What's the future of that mine, the Hemlo mine, and more generally of Barrick in Canada? So. First of all, we don't have a head office where I come from. It's a, called a corporate office, and it's uh, and it's very definitely in Toronto. And so, and we what I've been working with with the Barrick team uh, is, since the uh, the uh, votes is to work at what is appropriate in this modern day time, in line with the Rand Gold vision of you know uh, a corporate office should be dynamic, agile. It should be really the shareholder of the enterprise and holding the operations underneath it to account um, to deliver value for our owners. And so that's not gonna change. And if anything, what I would like to message is, you know, we should be proud of Barrick. It's got an amazing history. It's very much like Rand Gold, which I started way back, uh, Peter Monk started it well before me. Um, and it was a, on a pioneering vision, uh, focused on value with a small, 
corporate office, very dynamic and entrepreneurial as we are. And I, I have uh, every intention to, to bring that back uh, uh, to Barrick and, and to, to say to everyone, Barrick is back. We should be proud of being uh, team players in the Barrick family. And, uh, and one of the things that I really am focused on is we definitely need more assets in Canada. So don't get too hung up right now about us only having Hemlo. We're, on, we're definitely focused on growing this business and, uh, in, and, and you're correct in, if you're recognizing that we're underweight in our investments in Canada. Barrick had $5.7 billion US in debt the last time it reported as, the, as what, what is now the old Barrick. What would you like to see that number at and how, how fast can you bring that number down? So I'm not a great believer in debt. I believe as a gold miner, as in Rand Gold, we always look to have at least half a billion dollars of net cash on our balance sheet. The rest we paid out to shareholders. I have every focus of going down that road. We've got a much bigger spread of assets. So, you know, there's logic in carrying some debt, but right now we would like to restructure that debt. We've already started uh, on that. Um, we have some big capital uh, demands in the short term as we restructure and rearrange our assets to deliver value for our owners in the long term. But, uh, you know, uh, I think um, both John and I are in agreement that, uh, you know, no debt and more dividends is the, is the way that we should be looking at, uh, at things going forward. And I would just come back to you about this head office and office structure. You know, I'm not a person who, who, who hankers after an office. Uh, my passion is in the operations, uh, working with the management teams. Uh, you know, this is a big, heavy industry, engineering industry, uh, mining is. And uh, it's exciting to be able to unlock that value. And so I will definitely be coming through um, Toronto. It will be my corporate base, uh, and you'll see more of me. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, my focus is uh, out there where the real, uh, value creation should um, be realized, and that's where, where I'm going to spend my time. Let's just move uh, back to Canada. You seem to indicate fairly directly that the company perhaps has some interest in purchasing assets in this country. Uh, what type of thresholds does an, a, an acquisition anywhere in the world have to meet for you to uh, give it your stamp of approval? And is, is Canada, uh, are, are there, are the, do those type of opportunities exist here in Canada? So we would look at what we refer to as tier one assets plus 500,000 ounce production per year for more than 10 years in the bottom half of the cost curve. Um, and we want to look at, we, we look at the moment at 15% IRR, a long-term gold price of $1,200 an ounce. On a lower level, the second tier of investment we would still invest, which is the old Rand Gold filter, which is 3 million ounces or more which will give 300,000 ounces over 10 years production. And there we would look for a 20% return over a, uh, using a long-term gold price of $1,000 because that's a smaller uh, gold asset and, and need, we need to seek higher returns to ensure that we can deliver value for our stakeholders. What's the key for a global uh, gold mining company to operate successfully in volatile political and economic climates like the Democratic Republic of the Congo where, where in the past 20 years there, was, there has been a civil war and there's an election going on right now which is contentious and you referred to Tanzania as well. Uh, that's a situation where the government has upped its uh, uh, demands for royalties from Acacia Mining, a, a barrack subsidiary substantially. Uh, you, you and your team operated very successfully in markets like those for many, many years. What's the key to dealing with those, uh, with those governments in, in volatile parts of the world? The key um, is all around giving value, creating value for one stakeholder. So, you know, our, our owners are our most important stakeholders, of course, but equally important are our host country governments. And uh, so often our mining industry uh, promotes itself without delivering against that. And so the disappointment back at home in the host countries often transforms into a more aggressive approach to try and harvest uh, some of the value out of, out of the mining industry. And so that's what Rand Gold's been built on, is we, we, we look to our host countries as stakeholders, as important shareholders. We're mining their assets uh, anyway. 
and likewise with uh, you know developing skills and host country nationals and their em empowerment and development and uh, as with the service providers we, we, we're not good at including our host country business partners in our business we tend to import everything from outside the country and so so that's what's made uh, Rand Gold uh, s uh, different and in Barrick we've got the assets to be able to deliver value for our stakeholders and make a real meaningful contribution uh, to our host countries, as we have done in some parts of the world already. We'll let you go. Mark Bristow, thank you very much for stopping by on a busy day. Mark Bristow is President and CEO of Barrick Gold. It's day one of his day on the job.